I keep thinking things will slow down and then they just never do. So, but I'm, I'm doing what I love. So it's, you know, it's my job, but it's also my passion. So it kind of never ends. Lael, welcome to the Roadman Cycling Podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Fresh off another adventure, I see you're in Lithuania at the moment, or you were quite recently. Mm -hmm. Yep, just left Lithuania a couple days ago, so I went there uh, to visit my wife's family. She was born there, and so we biked all over the country to see both sets of grandparents and her mom and dad, so it was a lot of fun. How uh, how good is your wife? Is she a similar level to you? I'm sure she doesn't have that crazy no sleep ultra endurance gene you do. But can you go riding with her? Yeah, of course. It's my favorite. Actually, touring with Rue is is the best. We actually sleep at night, ride during the day, stop for snacks. But um, <laughs> you know, especially visiting family was the best way to go because once you get to their house, it's a lot of sitting and talking, which is nice. But you know, you're always looking out the window, so that way we could ride there and then show up super tired and happy to just take a break so it was a really nice balance for the trip what's that balance like normally because uh, i had a glance at your calendar for the year and <laughs> it's pretty jam-packed like so what's that balance like between family social training i'm such a newbie virgin into this whole world of ultra distance and bike packing i don't even know what training looks like for an ultra endurance rider like we'll get to that in a minute is it just like staying up late at night watching netflix movies and just getting no, no sleep for no weeks on way end? no no i don't <laughs> practice not sleeping if i'm not racing then i sleep or i or i try to because i feel like the lack of sleep is probably the least healthy aspect of this whole sport um but i'm always riding and this year I was racing so much that I was never really training. The, the racing was the training, and then I would rest, and then I would race again. Uh, I didn't know I could do so many events in a year. I think I've already raced six ultras this year, and then also done two women's rallies and some tours in between. So uh, this was kind of a test to see if I could even make it through, and um, it's been so much fun. It's taken me all over the world, and I still have a couple months left in the season with two more races, so uh, just hoping that I can... Um, you know, do my best out there and have fun and and ride fast. So when you sat down, I assume you sat down at, you know, roughly this point last year to plan out the season. Do you plan out the entire race calendar or are you picking it sort of quarter by quarter and sort of going, oh, we'll see how it pans out. We'll see what fatigue is like. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really, I think I started making plans for this year in the spring and then it was just from race organizers asking me if I could come. Um, and then I just saw what I could actually fit in. And I mean, it even on paper looks like, I don't know if that's really going to work, but I'll just try and see how it goes. And mostly I had planned April to end of June or beginning of July. And then I thought after that, I'll be done racing. And then it turns out that I ended up doing Badlands kind of last minute because I could fit it in before a women's rally. And I'm in a race rhino run in three weeks. Uh, and that was also last minute because the organizer asked if I could come. And it just, you know, I look at these things and I think, what, a, what an opportunity to go race in southern Spain or in South Africa. And, um, you know, I never know if I'll, right I'll be back. So it's a 2,700 kilometer race across South Africa and Namibia. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it's the first year of the race. It's uh, put on by Ryan Flynn and the guys from Curve uh, out of Australia. And Ryan is from South Africa, and he's been trying to organize this for three years. But with COVID, it kept getting canceled. And finally, it's on. And I think, you know, a week ago, he was like, can you can you come? Or two weeks ago, and then he kept asking, you know, if I could come. And I'm thinking, I'm just so tired. I can't do it. And then I talked it over with Rue because we've been on the road since April. Um, and she was like, well, if you don't go, you'll just be wishing you were there. So we have to go. Um, yeah, so we're, so we're going. So I keep thinking everything, I keep thinking things will slow down and then they just never do. So, but I'm, I'm doing what I love. So it's, you know, it's my job, but it's also my passion. So it kind of never ends. 
And logistically with Rue, how does that work for her? Does she have a nine to five job back home or is she working as part of the media crew with you? Yeah, she's, uh, we work together quite a bit now. Um, she used to, she's a photojournalist. Uh, that's what she went to school for. So she used to work for newspapers. Now she does a bit of freelance for newspapers, but she also shares my stories or our stories and then also works with other um, teams and, and people within the cycling industry. Um, so she's not working a regular job and I'm so fortunate to have her traveling with me, but then also shooting because, you know, that's how I can share my story is she's shooting photos and videos and, um, and she's really talented at it. So people can see the beauty that I get to see too. And you guys are killing it. Like your media game is on point. Oh, thank you. Well, it's all Rue. <laughs> I just get to ride my bike. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Layla, if I should say to you, two days, nine hours and 42 minutes, what's that mean? Mm, that was the Badlands finish, I think. Ugh, oh, man. And I think, I mean, I was like, I think 15th overall. And I don't think anybody within like the top 20 slept. You know, nobody was sleeping. It was, I mean, I, I like pulled over to take some cat naps on the side of the road, but like no real sleep. Uh, and nobody so was I got, sleeping. I got a funny story on this one. So you were, so we were chatting off air about my DNF after about, like what was the first climb? It was like 6K long or something. Uh, and then we had that bumpy descent with the pillars. Yeah, super so rough. So just around that bumpy descent with the pillars, like I got to the bottom of that and my bike had basically exploded. Like my DO2 had stopped working. My bottle cases had fallen off. My bag had broken. I was like, oh my God. But the DO2 I couldn't fix anyway. So I ultimately ended up dropping out of the race. But my teammate, Aaron Kearney, he went on just to complete it anyway. Mm -hmm. He wasn't eligible for the, the pairs category anymore, obviously without a teammate. And they don't transfer you over to the solo category, which is maybe a little bit unfair, but yeah. I don't know. <clears throat> but so he went on. So first night... I was watching and I'm a total newbie to this ultra distance, but I, someone had said to me, you need to check out Leah Wilcox. She's like hardcore, best female. <laughs> so I was kind of looking out for your name. And after the first day or end of the first day, going into the first night, my teammate Aaron, he was like 15 or 20 kilometers ahead of you. And I was like, go on Aaron, like what a legend. He's ahead of Leah Wilcox. Then I woke up the next morning in my Granada hotel room and I checked and you were like 240 kilometers ahead of me. Oh, no. Well, he probably stopped to sleep, you know, like a normal person would stop to sleep. And then I just kept going through the night. But yeah, I mean. So what's, the, what's that like? Are you... Are you totally setting out your stall? Like I seen some of the guys there, like we rode the first climb like way too hard. And when we got to the top, there was like seven of us there. And I'm sure the experienced people like you were just laughing, going, look at these idiots riding the first climb you so know hard. what I did? I was way too casual. <laughs> I, I was starting the race and I ran into my friend and I was super excited to see her. So then I'm like, just in the very, very back of the entire race, just chit chatting. And I was just like, like I wasn't even in focus mode that this was a race at all. And then I, you know, <laughs> like about, I mean, like 20 K in, I was like, what was I thinking? Just being back there, just goofing off. I should have, you know, had a little bit more like serious focus at the start, but I just didn't. So then I, you know, I mean, every minute counts like every other minute in these races and it's something that takes two days and almost 10 hours. is like, well, that's a lot of minutes. Uh, but I mean, I kind of, I kind of blew it. Not, not really being ready for the race. Cause I think I was just like, I've done so many races this year and so many events. I'm kind of in lava -la land and I really need to kind of get that razor focus back. Uh, I, we just want to get over that first climb. Cause that at the briefing the day before he'd said that first descent was super sketchy mm -hmm. and it had the bollards and stuff on it so kind of our thinking was well we want to at least take the descent in the front and then we can chill out and start riding our own pace so we rode the first climb kind of a bit harder than maybe we should have but what i noticed on the first climb was all the guys who were in the front and it was almost exclusively guys i don't know if there was any girls there but they ran such a super light setup. Mm -hmm. Like, are you going into the event knowing you're not going to sleep? You're not bothering to bring a bivy bag, no ground mass. Like, I brought a you're just bivy. Planning to yeah, I brought a bivy because I was like, well, I really don't know. Maybe I'll get really tired and then I want to sleep. But fortunately, 
It was so hot, even in the nights, I didn't even have to put anything on. I could sleep on the ground in a t-shirt and be fine. It was so warm. I mean, the days were (laughs) super hot, but then the nights were still really warm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that was kind of a nice thing was that you really didn't need any layers for comfort or survival or anything like that. But I did bring a bivy that I borrowed from a friend because I'd gone to Europe with the expectation that I was not racing. And then another friend of mine uh, was like, you could do this. You could do Badlands. I'll drive you there. I'll, I'll drive you to the next event you have. Um, She works for Kamut that was sponsoring the event. And so she gave me this idea and I was like, oh my God, I could actually do it. I could fit it in. So I got all excited and I signed up for the race and then I had like none of the equipment that I needed. So then I'm like asking friends, you know, can I borrow this? Can I borrow that? And, you know, kind of cobbled together the stuff that I needed for the race. Um, I'm so grateful I got to do it. It was so much fun, such a beautiful route and um, something I've been looking at for a few years. So it was really good. So in terms of your bike setup for us, uh, was there anything you would have changed? What width tires did you run? I ran 700 by 48. They're Rene Hurst. Uh, Oracle Ridge knobby tires and they were perfect you know fortunately going into this race I was I had time to tour some of the route with Rue before Um, so we rode about half of it before the race so I had a pretty good idea of what I was getting into Um, and I thought you know before we toured I thought oh I'll probably ride a mountain bike because it hurt it's pretty rough and usually if it's somewhat rough with endurance in mind I, I ride a bigger bike just for comfort uh, but after the tour, I realized gravel bike's perfect for this, especially my gravel bike because I have a suspension fork. So that helps a lot. Mm. And in terms of your light setup, what did you go with? Yeah, it was, um, I have a Dynamo front light, uh, which was great. Sine wave light runs All off the All the cool wheel. kids had the Dynamo. Well, for endurance, you need it because you'd never have enough time to charge your lights. So, I mean, yeah, it's hard me. to I carry like... enough batteries to, to get through two nights. You know, I mean, it's yeah. possible, but it's heavy and it's complicated and you're wearing like, will this last? So dynamo light uh, headlamp does, on my helmet and that was good. How does the dynamo light work? It's built into your hub and it's charging off that? Exactly. So you have a, a dynamo hub and then the light is connected to the hub. So you can turn it on or turn it off. I also have a USB port in the back so I could charge electronics out of that as well. Um, but it's just nice that it's, uh, consistent. You know, you, uh, you can always have light. You never have to worry about charging anything. The only issue is if, uh, the train is super technical and I'm riding like a really slow speed climbing on mountain bike trails, for instance, I'm not generating enough power to have a consistent light. Uh, so for that, I have to go back to regular bike lights with huge batteries and it's a pain. But, That's got to be depressing if you're going so slow, your lights won't even charge. Well, you know, if you're yeah. if you're doing technical mountain biking, it's common to go less than 10k an hour um, through the woods. Oh, so that's kind that's of the speed that you have to go to have a consistent beam. Okay, so it won't work if you're doing super technical stuff, or if you're just weak as piss. So <laughs> but otherwise, otherwise they're great. Otherwise they're great. I guess there's a, a bit more weight in the hub and a bit more resistance, but I'm not really thinking about that when I'm riding. And do you plan out your nutrition strategy or is it totally just calories whenever you can get them? I mean, in Spain, it was like, I definitely, I hardly ate anything, which is terrible because you need so many calories to go through this. I probably, I just lost a lot of weight, but, um, it's so hot. It's hard to eat. And then I didn't want to really stop for prepared food. So I just would take like ice cream to go and eat it on the bike. And that's pretty much all I ate. I ate tons of ice cream and I I usually love ice cream. And by the end, I was like, wow, this is the first time in my life that I'm really burnt out of eating ice cream. That's pretty bad. I thought you were going to come with this like really complex fueling strategy where you take like a beta fuel every 45 minutes. No, yeah, nothing like that. I mean, I had like, have like gnarly nutrition, these drink powders and actually having drinks and electrolytes for Badlands was pretty essential because it was so hot. Uh, So I did have like drink mixes. Anytime I'd see a fountain, I'd drink a bottle, fill it up with a mix, drink that, refill the bottle and then continue on because I just did the race with uh, two bottles. But I also had like, over a liter of Coke and over a liter of orange juice that I started the race with. Cause I was like, Oh, I'm just going to want to drink stuff. Uh, so that was my nutrition more or less. There's such a cool vibe at the, 
bike packing adventure stuff as opposed to road racing like my background's road racing so sitting in at the pre-race did you go to the saturday was it the day before briefing I yeah, what day yeah it was like a saturday mm-hmm. like that was hilarious i thought there was like an american guy asked at one point like will we have cell phone reception on the whole course and he's just like no you absolutely will not this is spain <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, I know. Nobody really knows what they're getting into. And that's kind of the fun of it, too, is you, you bring what you think you need and then you figure it out while you go. And I like that part of these races is that it's not so serious. You know, of course, it's serious that it's really hard. Uh, but, you know, the things that actually work are are all over the place. It's not the most aerodynamic or efficient system that maybe will win the race. Yeah, I seen like Taylor Finney wore like denim jeans. Yeah, shorts. and he had Did a cool bike denim? too with like a flat <laughs> bar, and you know, it's that's also like another approach you can take. You can you can still ride hard and just have fun. And when you're sort of planning out a race like this, is there any thought of I need to get a training block before this? I need to simulate the conditions I'm gonna face. Or is it a case, like you were saying, just bouncing from race to race? I mean, I think I was really fortunate that I had time to tour some of the route first uh, before the race. I think that's super helpful because then you kind of know the terrain you'll be riding, what you actually need out there. You can acclimate to the conditions. Um, That all helps. But as far as like a training block, I've I've never had that in my life. (laughs) So I, I don't even know where to start. I used to, if I had time, I'd ride to the start of all my races so, for instance, like the first time I raced the Tour Divide, I rode to the start from Alaska. Um, and so if I had the time, I'd ride to the start. And that was my training because I'd t- do long days in the saddle, get used to my equipment and be mentally prepared for the race. Uh, but now I'm so much busier that I often don't have time for that. So really, it's just, I mean, as the race goes, knowing where I can find food and water, knowing what kind of clothing I need for like the harshest conditions um and beyond that it's i don't know i just go for it and see how it turns out the tour divide is wild like what's it like over 4400 kilometers mm-hmm. starting in canada mm-hmm. across the rocky mountains finishing in mexico like i can't even fathom how you get your head around an event this big like even logistically you're a full-time bike rider but for most people are they taking like weeks off work to complete this are they just disappearing on family, saying to the missus, I'm going to get milk, and then they're coming back like four weeks later. Yeah, it's a big commitment. I mean, the fastest time is 14, just under 14 days, and that's the fastest time. So, you know, you're going to need, and then you need a bit of time to get to the start, and it finishes at the border with no services at all. Uh, There isn't even water there. So you have to figure out an exit strategy as well. So it's definitely, it's a beast, but the thing is, the riding is not super technical. It's all dirt roads, gravel roads, uh, pretty straightforward. A lot of public land, great camping, small towns. It's really lovely riding. Uh, it's really just the distance that makes it so hard. It's so long. Um, but really, that was my second race ever was the Tour Divide. Uh, and I knew I could ride distance because I'd been traveling the world on my bike. Um, so I wasn't intimidated by it. I, I thought the longer the better at that time. And now I think... God, that's a really long ride. You know, that's a long time to stay focused and to t- deprive yourself of sleep. And, you know, a lot can happen out there. But uh, it's, uh, you take them, you look at a map and that's what's so inspiring about this kind of riding. You can actually trace a line of where you're going to go and, but you really don't know what's going to happen when you're out there. So something about that is just um, so exciting. There's something so refreshing about it. So when uh... I Badlands didn't really work out DNF. I sitting in the hotel room. My teammate Aaron came back from Badlands and he's you know, he's pretty fatigued from it, but he's an ex pro bike rider, so he wasn't, you know, dead. And we were sitting on the hotel beds and we had a friend starting a bike packing trip in Biarritz and he was gonna ride from Biarritz to Girona. And we were sitting in Granada and we were like, you know, we should just ride to Biarritz. Yeah. And I was like, oh, well, that's going to be like 1,200 kilometers or something. And then we were like, fuck it, let's just do it. So we rode from Biarritz, from Granada to Biarritz and then Biarritz across to Girona. It took us like 11 days, sort of around 200 kilometers a day, but it was so much fun. Yeah. And like you're saying, just watching the map, where you've come from, looking back and tracing where you're going, there's something really satisfying about looking at your progress. That's so cool that you did that. But that's the kind of thing, that's like what is exciting to me about this sport is that you can go real places, but you really don't know what you'll see along the way. You can make, you know, change, you can make decisions about your route, where you stop, where, 
where you sleep and eat and, uh, you know, it's an adventure with a purpose. Um, so trips like that, like you said, you're like riding to Biarritz to see your friend. I mean, that's almost more fun than doing the race because it's your, you're making your own decisions and you're not in like in competition, but you still want to ride huge days just for the fun of it in the challenge. We bumped into this guy and we were nearly at Biarritz and he was bike packing also and he was from Singapore and we were chatting to him at a service station and we were kind of, you know, giving it a bit of a flex. He's like, oh, where'd you come from? And we were like on a chest out. Yeah, we came from Granada. I'm thinking we were hot shit. And we say to him, where have you come from? And he's like, Norway. And we're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Somebody will always ride farther or faster, you know. It's, yeah, so then you realize, like, I'm doing this because I want to do it. Yeah. And it's, it's super personal. Nobody else is going to care as much as you do. I watched you have a super cool video on YouTube if anyone is looking for to kill 20 minutes it's really enjoyable I think it's made in collaboration with Pearl Izumi about your 2019 tour divide yeah but something I thought was really interesting and I could almost hear the frustration in your voice during it it's you had a media crew following you but there was a portion of the I don't even know if you could call them the cycling community but there's a portion of keyboard warriors who objected to the morale boost you would get from having a media crew following you? Yeah, I'm still... How frustrating was that? I'm still dealing with that. Uh, oh, seriously? Oh, yeah, yeah. This is like when this kind of idea erupted. And I don't know, it's a little crazy because many, many men in the past have had media crews and nobody cared. Since this has happened, men have had media crews. And nobody cares when they do it. But if I do it, all of a sudden, it's a huge problem. Um, and it's super sad for me because the whole point is that I want to share these experiences and these beautiful places, but it's driven me to the point where next year I'm racing the triple crown of the U.S. bike packing races, which is Tour Divide, Colorado Trail, and Arizona Trail uh, without media at all. Uh, and the whole, my whole goal is just to show up and race other people, do my absolute best, um, and kind of show that I can perform well with media and without media, which I've also done in the past. In 2015, when I got into this sport, I raced the Tour Divide twice and the Trans Am with zero photos and zero video. And that's sad to me because I don't have anything to show from those uh, races. I mean, that was a total of, uh, I don't know, let's see, like, nearly 60 days of racing with zero photos and it's so to kind of ah. to summarize the debate for someone who doesn't really know what we're talking about i kind of and lael you're obviously a lot closer to the debate than i am i've literally just picked it up this morning so it, it the kind of the the keyboard warriors who are complaining about your media crew their point of view is that by seeing having media crew and specifically having your girlfriend as part of the media or is it your wife now mm -hmm. Apologies and congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Having your wife as part of the media crew, this is going to provide a morale boost, which other competitors don't get. And then that morale boost is going to have a cascading knock-on effect into your physical performance. Yeah, I mean, this is and insane. From your, from your end, then, you're just like, I want to document this stuff to inspire others and exactly. you know, show the beauty of these events. So is there... Like, is there a compromise or where is the compromise at the moment beyond you just not bringing any media crew, which I don't think serves anyone because we all want to go. Like, I want to go and ride the Tour Divide now having watched your video from the 2019 Tour Divide. Like, that's the power of the video. I know, and it it worked, actually. It got so many more people to to ride the Tour Divide and also just to even consider bikepacking. I get messages every week from people that have seen that video for the first time, and it made them feel so inspired that they went out and challenged themselves um, more than they ever had in the past. And I love those stories. Um, but I guess at this point I've made a video about the tour divide, actually two. I've also made a video about the Arizona trail. So I think in like for next year, I've kind of already done that work and it was super hard. I mean, it's, it's hard to coordinate media. It's hard. It's hard for them to find me on these routes. They're very remote. Uh, it's hard to put this all together, but we've done that work. So now I can go back to just focusing on the race. And uh, I'm hoping to make animations about my races next year. So I narrate the story and then we have an animator work to, to share that story um, with a cartoon, which is fun. It's a different way to kind of do this. Um, 
a different approach. So I think with the sport... If only there was a podcast you could come along <laughs> yeah. and get onto this podcast and I'll occasionally keep people updated. Yeah, I know. That would be something magical. Yeah, I think uh, that's the thing. Is like you want to bring people along for these rides because they love following them, especially while they're live because you really don't know how it's going to turn out. I mean, even think for you, it's like you had no idea you were going to like break your DI too. And that's tragic, but that's also like, that could have happened in the last 10 K. And then what would you have done? Would you have just walked to the finish or would it be over, you know, something like that. And that's, that's kind of the, the sport is you never know what's going to happen. And I mean, a terrible mechanical is, is always tragic. Cause it's like, there's nothing you can do. It's very frustrating. Um, but I think, yeah. I think the, the media debate is frustrating because I know sitting on, you know, the media side of the fence, and it's weird even calling myself media being just a bike rider with a podcast, but I get so many messages, emails, Instagram DMs from people who, like, say last week, that ride from Granada to Biarritz and across to Girona. Like, we got so many messages from that from people stuck in their work saying, I'd always want to do a bike packing trip yeah. and I never had the confidence and following your trip has given me that confidence to like book the time off work and do this trip. You can see how impactful it is to real people. Yeah. And that's such a net positive gain for our, our cycling community right? versus the absolutely minuscule perceived damage that some of these keyboard warriors think it's causing. And the reality is most of them probably don't even cycle anyway. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think some of them do, but I don't know... I sometimes I wonder about the motivation for this criticism because it's like it's only, only directed towards me and now these races are getting new rules. Where a bikepacking race, basically they say bikepacking has no rules except you can't receive outside assistance and you have to ride the route. Uh, and then all of a sudden there's like an asterisk at the bottom that says, and no media. Uh, on an individual rider. And Asterix Lale's not allowed to use their phone. Yeah, yeah, that was also part of it. Like, they asked me not to use my phone. Everybody else is using their phone and FaceTiming their families. The first time I raced the Tour Divide, I had a flip phone. Uh, <laughs> and I don't think I had service. Like, uh, old school. So, you know, it's like... <laughs> and then I was riding down from Alaska to the start. I had a flip phone with no service. They changed the track, and I didn't even know because I was offline. You know, so it's like you just, this stuff, I mean, you go into it with the best intentions and then you have to just kind of reevaluate, like, am I making good choices? Am I doing my best to, to share the sport that I love and have it be fair for everybody? And I, I honestly believe that I am. I don't think that, you know, making videos is, is helping me ride faster. In fact, it may slow me down because I stopped to you know, talk to the camera to update what I'm doing and what's happening. And then I lose time and I lose focus as well. Um, so I don't know. I, I'd, I'd a really interesting guest on the podcast. Uh, it's probably like 200 episodes ago. And he is an adventurer, but he mainly hikes and walks and he walks around Europe, brings his tent and like he's walked around some crazy places, Africa and stuff. But he said the number one question he gets is, aren't you scared to camp? <laughs> and he said, when you actually take time to pause and think about what that question means, the question isn't, aren't you scared to camp? The question is, I'm scared to camp. Like, why shouldn't I be scared to camp? So people are projecting right. their insecurity onto him. Always. saying They are scared to camp. So when I look at your videos and my girlfriend's just getting into cycling and she was over at Badlands with me and she's thinking like, oh, I'd love to do that next year. Like when she sees, you know, 15, 20 guys at the front of the race, that doesn't help erode that fear for her. When right. she sees you killing it and mixing it with the best guys in the world, all of a sudden she's watches some YouTube videos of you and she's like, oh, Lael just looks like a normal girl. Like you're obviously a superhuman X-Man, but you <laughs> just look like a normal girl. And that helps break down barriers and that helps get more partic female participation yeah. in the sport, which we badly, badly need at all levels. Yeah. Yeah. I totally, I, I totally agree with that because people look at me and they see that I did something and they're like, well, if she did it, maybe I could, maybe I could do it too. Or maybe I could at least try. And that's the, the energy that I want to encourage. It's not about being the best or winning all the time, but people, instead of feeling like they're, they are not welcome or they can't even try, they're not strong enough. They, they're not limited by that thought. They give it a go. And then if they don't like it, that's fine, you know, do something else. But like, 
you never want that like stunted feeling like you can't do it. You're not capable. So I think, and I like that thought you had about they're projecting their fears on you because I feel like as a woman, we get that so, so much, um, where people are like, do you feel safe? Uh, is it okay for you to do this as a woman? And I've actually, I, you know, I've traveled all over the world and I've never had a problem. And I've, I've ridden solo and I've raced solo and I've done all these things and I've never had anyone put me in danger. And I know that that's a risk, but I don't think it's like a grave risk for me as a woman more than for, you know, a guy. Uh, I think we all kind of, you know, face this. And also when you're passing through these areas, most crime is premeditated. If I'm just riding through a random place, people aren't like we're sitting there ready to attack me, you know? So I think that the risk is pretty minimal compared to, you know, you could get hit by a car. That's a much higher risk. That's a much more like common thing that would happen. And that's something that I'm also willing to accept because I want to ride my bike. So. And that's why I thought even the, the concession you made not having a phone for the tour divide like there's actually a safety element to that for badlands like we had that whatsapp group where you could put messages in mm -hmm. and one kind of almost hilarious but equally tragic message i put seeing someone putting in it's like cup six zero please send help into the whatsapp group oh, no. i was sitting in my hotel going that, that doesn't sound good uh, and then the yeah. next message came from someone else going oh i just found cap six zero he's in a bad way he has heat exhaustion oh, and then they're no. like, we'll reply directly yeah, I didn't join the WhatsApp group. What? Uh, <laughs> I don't know that. Oh, uh, you missed out. Yeah, I guess I did. Uh, I don't know. I still have like a spot tracker or we have trackers. So there, there is like safety in that, that people know where you are. Uh, but, you know, people have brought that up to me too. They're, they're like, aren't you worried that people could stalk you? And I've never had like, I mean, that's possible. That's kind of a creepy thought. Um but I've never had like a bad stalker, you know, maybe a fan comes out to say hello or something. But usually these these events are so hard to access that that's probably also a safety too from people. It's like nobody can actually find you. Uh, you're yeah, that it's, you're it's that. It's got to be a committed stalker to like go into the, the Garafi <laughs> desert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, so I don't know. Uh, for the for the non sort of ultra bike packing nerds among our audience, uh, Talk to me about the uh, Trans Am record and, yeah. you know, even the event. Yeah, so I raced the Trans Am in 2016. It's a road race across the U.S. Uh, west to east, it's 7,000 kilometers, um, all on paved roads. It's a uh, historic touring route in the U.S. based off of the Trans Am bike touring route that Adventure Cycling put out in 1976. And this is actually a cool backstory. In 1976... 4,000 young people crossed the U.S. on this route, um, which is wild cool. to think about because they must have like signed up by sending letters to each other. So for somebody to organize <laughs> that big of an event that summer is really Pigeons. cool. Yeah, exactly. Uh, anyway, so I signed up for the race in 2016 uh, with very little experience riding road, but I thought, because I, I had experience with gravel and mountain biking, and I thought, ah, oh, it's on the road, it'll be easy. And that was such, so far, far out. It was so, so hard. Um, but I was so determined. Going into this race, I had huge ambitions. I said, I'm going to win overall, and I'm going to break the current record, uh, which was held by Mike Hall at the time at 17 and a half days. And then I get like five days into this race and I felt horrible and I was way behind the leaders. And I was like, what was I thinking? <laughs> There's no way I can win this race or break the record. But I was like, I still just, no matter what, just have to keep working as hard as I can and do my very best. And that's all I can do. So I stuck with it. I was sleeping, I think like five hours a night, um, mostly in like grass fields because I was super poor. I didn't have bike sponsors. I worked in restaurants to save money to do this race. And I thought I better do well because this is like all of my savings. Uh, so I stuck with it, kept like pushing on. Then getting into the race, I start kind of like gaining, um, like getting t more towards the front of the pack. Uh, by like a weekend, I'm in third or fourth place chasing these two in the front. Then I catch, there was like one guy and one woman and they were way out the front. They were sleeping maybe an hour a night. Um, but finally I catch the woman in Colorado, Sarah Hammond from Australia. 
uh, pass her. And then the guy, um, by the time he gets to like to the halfway point in Kansas, he gets so stressed that I'm like gaining on him that he stops sleeping. He's just like, like, it, like a hunted animal, but I'm gaining on him and I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to get him. And I get within like, uh, I'm probably a thousand K from the finish. And I'm like, okay, this is where I really have to start making moves because you know, the only way I can catch this guy is if I start cutting sleep. So in the last three nights, I sleep like a total of six hours and I catch oh, him in brutal. the final night at like three in the morning. And we still have like 200, over 200 K to go. And I start sprinting like it's the end of the race when I see him. Cause I got so excited. I finally caught this guy. I didn't know who he was. I'd never seen him cause he'd always been ahead of me. And then, um, and then I was, uh, sprinting. And then he's like, you know, asking me if we can just finish together. And I was like, no way. I was like chasing you for over <laughs> two weeks. This is a race. And so then I drop him and then I end up winning the race overall. And I couldn't, I mean, it really didn't hit me that this was real until, you know, he was like behind me and I was like, oh my God, I might actually win this race. Then I got super paranoid because it's all self-supported. And I was like, you know, what if I have a mechanical now? Or what if something goes really wrong? Or what if I go off route? And so then I was like dead focus on like, don't make any mistakes. Don't get a flat tire, finish the race. Uh, and I did. And then I, I waited for the guy, the second place guy to finish. So he came in about two hours later. Um, and then I was, I mean, more than anything, I was just so happy that it was over. It took 18 days. So I didn't get the record, but I finished eight hours slower than the record uh, or for something that took 18 days. So, I mean, I was actually pretty close, but from the start, I was like, this is impossible because it seems like, you know, it seems like it's never going to end. It seems like there's no way you could succeed, but I think it's the dedication day after day of, of just keeping that focus and working hard to actually make it happen. You know, nobody wins these races by accident. It's so much sacrifice. Um, and then so many things happen and like my seat post broke in uh, Missouri and I had to ride standing up for 80 K to get to a bike shop, to get a new seat post. Uh, oh you know, gosh. I slashed my tires sidewalls twice and then I had tubeless, which I thought was going to be perfect. And then it ended up, you know, I just put tubes in anyway. Um, but, uh, that's so all part the, of it. Where's the tipping point with, uh, where's the tipping point with sleep versus performance? Like obviously the less you sleep, the more potential riding hours you have but i'm sure there's a diminishing marginal returns at some point if you're sleeping one hour a night that's going to catch you after like you know four or five days right versus if you're sleeping four or five hours a night that's maybe more sustainable is like where's the sweet spot for you i think for me it's about yeah four hours a night for something that takes you know over a week that's great for me but then i find the more competitive this is getting the less people are sleeping you know some people will yeah. sleep only every third night <laughs> which I think is just horrible. I'm like, you, at some point, you're like, you can't focus your eyes. Your whole body feels awful. I actually like, I'm in this because like I'm competitive, but I also love the experience. Like I love being out there. And if I don't sleep at all, then I really don't love it anymore. I'm not really with it. So I, I tend to sleep. I, I try to be a bit strategic with it. Sleep while it's dark. Sometimes I'll sleep earlier in the night and then wake up in the middle of the night and continue. Um, because when you think about it, it's like the hours don't, it doesn't really matter when you do anything as long as you have a good plan. Did you even have a nap in Badlands or was it just straight through? No, I, I laid down on the side of like gravel road and just, I would set my alarm for 15 minutes and then I would wake up. <laughs> I would wake up before it went off. Um, in the end, I you know, maybe I should have slept for an hour instead. Cause I think I pulled over like six times, uh, just to sleep a little bit, but it's amazing. Like some of this too, is it's just fascinating to see how your body and mind will respond because I would, I'd just be like to a point where I really couldn't focus. And this was probably the scariest for the descents because like you need to focus when you descend, you need to be looking and paying attention to where you're going. And then, you know, my eyes just felt like they were all over the place. So I'd stop sleep a little bit and then I would open my eyes and I would see so clearly again, you know, even after just 10 minutes. So it's, it's kind of crazy, like how, how you can recover uh, at least a little bit. And then an hour later, I'd be tired again, sleep a little bit again, and then continue on. But, um, your body can, everything becomes normal at some point. 
Yeah, because it's I've had uh, sleep doctors on the podcast, and what you're actually doing is it's low level like brain damage you're getting for every waking <laughs> hour when you should be sleeping. And how we repair that is with sleep. But when you go without sleep, you're literally brain damaging yourself as you go along. So you start feeling quite dopey and that sort of tactile link between your thoughts and being able to actually perform motor actions with your hands and your feet, that that all slows down. So I can see how like a descent where you're having to like perceive an obstacle and then swerve around it or jump over it, how that just all slows down to the point that it becomes quite dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I used to be like, you know, if I can't focus, then, then I'll stop. And I guess I'm still like that where I feel like if my eyes can't focus, then that's when I need to stop. Um, although I found like the more I do this, like, I don't hate those moments. I, it's harder to, to ride through the night. It's just harder to feel awake, to feel alert. Once the sun comes back up, I feel totally fine. My energy's back. I'm not sleepy so anymore. It's crazy. So the long nights are definitely the toughest part. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's not healthy. It's just something that we do and it's part of the competition. If somebody was trying to get into bikepacking now, what sort of piece of advice would you have? Something that you know now that you wish you knew when you were starting? Oh, hmm. Something I wish I knew when I was starting. Uh, I guess the concept that, like, it's it should be fun. Like, even these trips you set up for yourself, like, you have to get from point A to point B. You know, it's like, if it's not working out, change the plan. You know, if you need to hitch a ride for a section, that's fine. Nobody else cares if you make this like completely from point A to point B. <laughs> like these rules we make for ourselves are not serving anything. Uh, it should be like you should have a good time out there because this is like it's hard enough without putting extra pressure on yourself. Like I used to be like, I'm riding up the West coast of the U S and that's my plan. And I have to do that. And then, you know, one trip I rode into a headwind for I think over a month and I was like, then oh like years gosh. later, I'm like, why didn't I just ride the other direction? You know, why didn't I just like take a train and then ride South or uh, another trip I was riding down the West coast and I had rain every day for six weeks. And now I'm like, why didn't I just go somewhere else and have a better trip? Uh, but I think I was so like dedicated to just this one thought that that's all I had to do. Now I guess I do that with the racing because no matter the conditions, everybody's facing it. You just have to do it. Uh, but if it's your own trip and it's for fun, just make it like the best time you can. Actually enjoy it. Have, have the adventure that you want to have because nobody else cares what you're doing out there. Well, isn't it funny? People just get like agitated on social media. We had two or three days in a row of just block headwinds. Like we were riding super hard and going like 11 kilometers an hour oh. on the way up to Biarritz. Yeah. So a tractor pulled out one of the days like going like 25 26k an hour and i put up a video on my instagram of holding on to the back of the tractor and yeah. just towing along but then you can go into you know your instagram you can go into the like the other folder where people you aren't friends with can send you messages and people are like replying to it going like you're fucking cheating like this is oh disgraceful I'm like, it's like what are what? you this doing so weird. yeah it's like <laughs> there aren't any rules for this it's my trip i could do it however i want i know that's so i think that's yeah, also I'll hold part on to of the tractor for the whole trip if i want part of cycling is that it you know because it's like such a simple beautiful machine it's also you know a lot of purists are involved in the sport so that and, you know, if it's anything outside of, of cycling or outside of like this pure concept, then it's something that's negative. And I, I don't like that. I feel like we should welcome more people. People should ride e-bikes. People should do it in any way that gets them involved in cycling. And that's like the joy of it. And that, that will change their life, spending that much time outside being active. You know, it's like in any capacity you can do that. That's, that's what I'm all for. Yeah, I'm so excited to see e-bikes coming because, like, I look at, you know, I'd love nothing more than to do a bike packing trip with my dad, but mm -hmm. he's like almost seventy and he can't ride the bike for six, seven, eight hours a day. But with e-bikes, it's like a handicap and golf. He's this is so possible cool. again. It's so brilliant. Yeah, you can bring more people along, and they still are doing the adventure, and it's still hard for them. It's still a super challenge. You know, it's not like you just get a free ride. So that, yeah, I hope you do that with your dad Lael uh, thanks for chatting you're inspiring so many people I think uh, and specifically getting really help with female participation and breaking down those barriers so keep doing your media stuff don't listen to the haters and keep having those adventures <laughs> hey thanks so much so good talking with you and are you going to go back for Badlands again next year 
I was just talking to the organizer today, so I am indeed yeah, cool. going to go back next year. Super cool. See you then. Thanks for chatting. That was cool, Al. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, of course. Uh, thanks so much. That was uh, so much fun. Yeah, so you're welcome to jump back on any time. So as I say, the podcast is totally just like, I'm not a cycling journalist. I'm a cyclist. And I want to give like that platform, like it's north of 100,000 people tuning in every week now. And I feel there's not many independent podcasts now. Most of them are like, you know, podcasts that are owned by a company that, you know, Zwift or BBC or something like this. Mm -hmm. So it's it, like, I want the podcast to be almost like a community podcast where anyone with a cool, interesting story that's going to inspire others can jump on at any point. Or if you have big, you know, you're trying to promote stuff for sponsors and things like that you can always just say, hey, I also have access to a podcast and I can jump back on there whenever I want. And, you know, that might help you get some sponsor stuff across the line as cool. well. Cool. Thanks so much. And lovely talking with you. And I love that you did that trip to Beer Eats. That's awesome. That's like... Oh, so much fun. The, I'm still suffering. Yeah, such a, such a cool idea, turning something that didn't go right into like even a better adventure. So we'll, super cool. We'll have to do a, a bike packing trip where we podcast live from the road and create some cool yeah. on the road as well yeah that That'd sounds like fun, fun. cool Lael, thanks for chatting yeah Stay in touch. great Talk talking soon. with you Bye.